Welcome, it's indisputable. I'm your host, Rashad Richie, good to be with you. We have a lot on the agenda today. In the bullpen, we have none other than April Ryan, a White House correspondent, author and DC Bureau Chief for the Grio. Should be a fascinating bullpen. Breaking down news of the day, we have Dan Evans, host, Good Morning Bad News, Power Report, and audio face, remarkable individual and fascinating breakdown is coming. I guarantee you that. All right, first story of the day, Donald Trump, former President of the United States had a big announcement to make. He wanted to make sure everyone who supports him purchases his new NFT trader card. Here it is. Hello everyone, this is Donald Trump. Hopefully your favorite president of all time, better than Lincoln, better than Washington, with an important announcement to make. All right, important announcement. Um, what is that announcement, Mr. Former President? I'm doing my first official Donald J. Trump NFT collection right here and right now. They're called Trump Digital Trading Cards. These cards feature some of the really incredible artwork pertaining to my life and my career. It's been very exciting. You can collect your Trump digital cards, just like a baseball card or other collectibles. Here's one of the best parts. Each card comes with an automatic chance to win amazing prizes like dinner with me. I don't know if that's an amazing prize, but it's what we have. Or golf with you and a group of your friends at one of my beautiful golf courses, and they are beautiful. I'm also doing Zoom calls, a one-on-one -on -one meeting, autographing memorabilia, and so much more. We're doing a lot. My official Trump digital trading cards are $99, which doesn't sound like very much for what you're getting. Buy one and you will join a very exclusive community. It's my community, and I think it's something you're going to like, and you're going to like it a lot. They also make perfect gifts. So you can buy them with your credit card or crypto. All you need is an email address. Go to collecttrumpcards.com and buy your Trump digital trading cards right now before they are all gone and they will be gone. Donald Trump is a crackhead. Obviously, this was one of those moves where you have to scratch your head and wonder, well, damn, is he hard up for money? What is happening here? Will his followers all start purchasing these NFT Donald Trump trading cards? Well, here's what Steve Bannon said. Okay, I got it. I got it. I can't watch it again. Make it stop. Um, on a day when you have one of the most important announcements about really the coup and about big tech oligarchs involvement in it and what's going to happen and how you're going to clean out this mess. And the sense of urgency, I think it has to start now. That's why President Trump's got to get engaged in this omnibus because we have the ability to execute on his plan now, although you don't control the White House, as command by negation with the House and the appropriations bill. This thing comes out and this whatever. And they said yesterday there's going to be a big announcement. Look, I thought the announcement could be people are coming to me. Is he going to announce for speaker? Is he going Announced for speaker. Sir, do you know how much money he can make from the NFT trade industry? Speaker, come on. Okay, so Steve Bannon, he represents the old white male Trump continuum. He's on one side of the spectrum. What about, let's say, a young black male Trump supporter? How do they feel about his new commercial? Here it is. Once upon a time, America was at the brink of destruction. And Trump said he had a major announcement. Everyone gathered round. The left ran in fear, they were ready to run. The right celebrated, the savior has come. He said he has a major announcement, everyone gathered round. And the announcement came, cards. We were at the brink of destruction. Cards? Cards for $99. <laughs> you 
you got to laugh sometimes. You've got to laugh. Yeah, Christian Walker, uh, son of Herschel Dam Walker. You're right. You have to laugh not to cry. You all are the ones who produced Donald Trump. We told you not to. We warned you. It was a con artist, a snake oil salesman. He sold you a false bill of goods. You purchased it. And now, for some reason, it seems as if the spell is wearing off. Literally, a person who's going to prison for Donald Trump said, I can't believe I'm going to prison for an NFT salesman. Let's put his picture up. Baked Alaska, notorious capital rioter. Baked Alaska was suddenly filled with regret over his life decisions after watching former President Donald Trump hawk digital trading cards in a video in which he also declared himself a better president than George Washington. Baked Alaska, who earlier in the day said he believed Trump's digital card gambit means he can't win in 2024, wrote a follow up in which he questioned his own decision to storm the Capitol building on January 6th, 2021. So all of a sudden, they are questioning these dynamics. Let's put up the message from Baked Alaska. He says, I can't believe I'm going to jail for an NFT salesman. Believe it, sir, believe it. When you are incarcerated, I want you to remember every day of your life, that you are in jail away from your family and friends, your racist support groups. You are in that position because you decided to support and commit acts of crime for a person who would rather sell you a damn fake ass MFT card. They're not even real. Look at the pictures. Can we put up one of the pictures really quickly? Donald Trump said, this is about my life story, when in the hell has Trump ever been that person or Superman or an astronaut? Although Baked Alaska was once a major Trump supporter in his first two presidential campaigns, he has now apparently switched his allegiance to rapper Kanye West, the leader of the White Lives Matter movement, Kanye West, who has taken to openly praising Nazi dictator Adolf Hitler and denying the Holocaust ever happened. Earlier this year, Baked Alaska pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor count of parading, demonstrating or picketing inside a Capitol building for which he faces up to six months in prison. Should have been arrested obviously for domestic terrorism, he was not. Now, here's the reality. Every single one of us, well, maybe not all of us, but the vast majority of those who consume this program, We have always known Donald Trump was a con artist, a salesman, an individual who is low quality in a high quality suit. That is it, that's all he has ever been, nothing less, nothing more. Was it the racism of Trump that caused his followers to say, whoa, wait a minute, that's too far? No, was it when he mocked the disabled? Was that when his followers said, wait a minute, Trump? No. Was it when he protected racist and said, they're actually very good people, by the way, that didn't do it. How about when he proclaimed how he likes to sexual assault women? They were good with that, but damn it, he went too far trying to sell them NFT trading cards. Now the game has completely changed, ironic to say the least. My dear brother, what are your thoughts here? It always seems to be when the shoe is on the other foot that you start to get the actual response back from them. I mean, we have to remember back from 2016, the night of the election when a lot of people thought wrongfully that Hillary Clinton was going to win, that Donald Trump had already set up his post election venture. It was gonna be Trump TV, who's gonna have a competitor to Fox News. He already had him set up on election night in Trump Tower, but then He was surprised, everyone was, a lot of people were surprised in saying in that Donald Trump won the 2016 election. So 
before that, there were Trump stakes and Trump jets and all these other ventures. Maybe like one out of 20 of these succeeded. Let's never forget that Donald Trump is one of the few people who has managed to go bankrupt while owning casinos, right? Like the house always wins and he still went bankrupt, all right? Like not a smart guy over here, right? So it only happens when the shoe is on the other foot, when these conservatives start to feel that they're scammed, all right? So always remember that, like the hypocrisy, of course, we expect the hypocrisy there. But note that deep down all these people will feel once that they're scammed, it's too much for them. The, the, the baked Alaska tweet where he's like, "Oh, great, I'm going to jail for an NFT salesman, pure schadenfreude. But I think my favorite part of the entire story was the fact that Donald Trump himself in that interview was had like no inflection to his voice, no enthusiasm, very low right. energy Donald there. He had all the enthusiasm of like a patient woman who realizes 15 seconds into the first date that she doesn't wanna be here anymore. And she's just counting down to when her parking meter runs out to when she can finally get the hell out of there. Like it was just so low charisma. This is, I mean, definitely not to speak of the anti-Semitism, the calling for the abolishing of the constitution, the absolutely terrible run when it came to a lot of his key endorsements in the 2022 primaries, but Donald Trump ain't got the sauce. <laughs> like this is this is That's not right. the same guy from 2016. And I could be wrong. We could all be fooled and surprised, but this is going to be a much tougher time for him. And it is currently very fun to watch him stumble and fail like this. I think your analysis is spot on. I do believe this is going to be a very different reality for Donald Trump than the first time he won that presidential cycle. <laughs>
Um, he said per the, per the report, this isn't the first complaint about extreme heat in that facility. The lawsuit cites multiple complaints by the director of mental health services. So literally the contractors complained. Multiple inmates complained about the temperatures a year before the death of Mr. Rutledge. Yet nothing was done. Now you have gross negligence. Gross negligence is actionable. That means you have a civil action possible now and you also have potentially a criminal dynamic because of the gross negligence of this staff. They have a duty, a responsibility to care, to provide appropriate functions to assist with inmates. They did not. Um, literal horror stories have come out of Alabama prisons by the inmates themselves. We have covered multiple starvation, work conditions, overcrowding and now overheating. Make it seem as though the inmates are being subject to one huge cruel and unusual experiment on ways to kill someone. The Department of Justice has since brought a case before Judge Proctor in concern of these conditions. Families have been waiting years now for the case to be heard. If you recall one particular case, Mr. Vaughn, remember Mr. Vaughn? Mr. Vaughn went viral on social media because his sister had a picture of him from the prison in Alabama where he looked deceased. He did not even look alive in the picture. That picture went viral. We reached out directly to the sister, spoke with the sister. By that weekend, we had a private investigator and civil rights attorneys in Alabama. Not only were we able to reach Mr. Vaughn, talk to Mr. Vaughn directly, even though the jail would not allow him to talk to his family before we got involved. We were able to connect him with this family and we got him removed from that facility. I am happy to report he's doing much better today. The last picture I saw of him, he actually gained significant weight and his sister posted, praise God. Now let me say this, cruel and unusual punishment is against the law. You have a constitutional right against that. Why do you believe Alabama seems to be the habitual offender as it relates in particular to black men inside of their prison system. Okay, uh, we're gonna continue to follow this obviously. I do believe more complaints are coming. Dan, thoughts here. I'm glad we're following this and it's a special kind of journalism where not only are we covering the story, and we're exposing the facts of it, but you're also going the extra step of once you have the media attention, it seems that okay, now all of a sudden things start moving by in this case. Now, of course, like what you're talking about, hotter than three hells here. Like yeah. people complain when it's, you know, the, the temperatures are warmer, when you reach like record temperatures in the city whenever time or whenever your town, whenever you're walking around. This is absolutely cruel and unusual punishment, perhaps the only cynical argument against it would be saying that this has become too usual within our so called criminal justice system. Of course, it's happening a lot in Alabama and a lot in the South and a lot happening to people of color all around like in those areas. But we're seeing it happen in places like Rikers, we're seeing it happen on the West Coast as well, where these are cruel conditions where the fact is naturally given that, okay, well, if we keep people in these close conditions where it's really hot, where diseases spread very quickly, then you're probably going to have some deaths. And that has been factored into the calculus because as we've said before, as is emphasized on the show a lot, we do not have a rehabilitation system in this country. We have a recidivism and a torture system in this country. And moreover than that, a lot of it has been privatized and turned into a profit making venture. So this is just one anecdote of many that we need to have in our tool belts when we say we need to destroy this system and make it better because at bare minimum like you're in you're incarcerated. You are suffering enough at that point, right? Like you are doing your time. The least we should do is like torture you while you're there. You should be able to expect a time to be able to come out. Yeah. All right, we will continue to follow and bring updates as they develop. Okay, an exclusive 
And we brought you an interview directly with Mr. Tony Wynn, who was falsely arrested for criminal trespass. He was not the person they thought he was. We interviewed him. Now we have another update. The actual security guard who called 911 thinking he was another person did speak to us. Now, let me first give you the update from that story. Here it is. Here. A year? Yes, you can't come back. That was like 10, 15 years ago. What are you talking about? There's no limit on that. We are grocery shopping. What are you talking about? You're trespassing the store. You're not allowed to be here, all right? It said 10, 15 years ago. Let's go. Where are you taking him? What the? Where are you taking him? Once you trespass as well, so let's go. For what? For grocery shopping? That guy right there. No, for being trespassed. For grocery shopping? Hey, look, record him right there. The trespass has been confirmed. He has been trespassed here actually this year. So he will not be staying here. He's going to be going to jail tonight. All right, I need you to get in the car and drive away because if you come back here, you're going to also be going to jail for trespass. Okay. This is disgusting. I'm sorry you feel that way. I'm literally going to go on a seizure. I'm telling you. If you go into seizure, let me know. I'll have EMS come out. Very sad. The Walmart security guard who called the police, he was wrong. He said, well, his name is Cody. He has been trespassed from the property. That was not Cody, that was Tony. Uh, Tony had not been criminally trespassed from the property that year. Let's put up the picture full mass. We had Tony on the show um, and talked directly to him. That's him in the bullpen and then a picture of him and his girlfriend who was with him that night. Let's keep that picture up. I wanna explain something because Many years before, there was a trespass issued to Mr. Tony Wynn. He explained that trespass. It was connected. It was connected to an unfortunate situation at a dentist. Not a huge deal. After a year, he was able to come back to that Walmart. And he has been for years now. So here's the dynamic that's important. When you have been criminally trespassed and a commercial entity has issued this against you. If that commercial entity decides to later engage in business transaction with you, they have now set aside the trespass by behavior. They have now through behavior, through action, through the transaction of business, they have now said, It is permissible for you to be here. So that's number one. Number two, the security guard thought Tony Wynn was somebody else. He was completely 100% wrong. We have the 911 call and we have the security guard on record. So let's get to it. Um, Hernando County Sheriff's Public Information Officer, Denise Maloney said to indisputable, Tony's arrest was rightful, her words, rightful. This gentleman was trespassed from the exact location where he was placed under arrest. Now he was trespassed in the year 2013. That has not been rescinded. Therefore, it's still active and we are obligated to act upon that if he's on the premises when we're there. Look at this, wait a minute, the 911 call said he was trespassed that year said his name, and here's the irony. They had the name based on what the security guard said. The name was different than Tony's name. They never even bothered to require identification to see if his name matched the name from the 911 caller. They never did even that level of basic police work. Uh, She disregarded that he was confused uh, for another Asian man. Tony seems to be going on the premise that we arrested him thinking that he was someone else. 
So I don't know where the other name came from or why there's confusion or confused identity. But this gentleman was trespassed from that store. The police report states, Cody's booking photos match that of the detained Asian male. Here is who Walmart security confused Tony with. This is the man named Cody. The name Cody came from the call Walmart security made to police in which they said the man could be armed and dangerous. Now let me take you to that 911 call and you will realize how dangerous this situation really was for Tony. Here it is. There is an Asian male in the store right now. His name is Cody Vonderlin. He is trespassed from the store. He is not allowed to be here. And he also tends to be violent and carries weapons. What is he wearing? I I did not get a great look at him. I think it's like a blue long sleeve shirt and a backwards hat. I didn't want to make eye contact with him because he's very aggressive and he knows who I am. Okay, give me one moment to know that. Okay, Julie Emmer's calls with dispatch, sorry. Yeah, he's looking for you. Where is he? Uh, HVA. <clears throat> he's looking for me? Yeah, he's saying that while she's shopping, he's standing in action alley looking around looking for you. Yeah, this guy's got to, he's got to get arrested. I'm tired, he can't be in here. This guy absolutely sucks. Okay, no. you said he's very aggressive and he carries weapons? He tends to carry knives on his person, yes. And he is very confrontational, very aggressive. Okay. I'm still looking around looking for you. Does he have any um, the last time he was here, he was also trespassing. He came in like a giant Hummer with a trailer on it. I did not see what car he arrived in today. Once again, wrong man. This phone call, this 911 call has nothing to do with Mr. Tony Wynn. He is not aggressive. He has never threatened anyone. He does not carry weapons. He does not drive a Hummer. His name is not Cody. Even though the security guard provided all of this information that by the way was completely inaccurate. They are still justifying the arrest because of a trespass from many, many years ago. Now keep in mind, please keep in mind that the police never even required or requested identification from Tony Wynn. You see, this would have been simple if they did basic police work. Hey, we got a 911 call, is your name Cody? No, my name is not Cody. As a matter of fact, my ID is in my right pocket. Can I show it to you? My name is Tony. Ah, well, obviously you're not the right person, Tony. Have a good day. Let's put up the picture of this Spring Hill Walmart, okay? Indisputable reached out to the Walmart security guard in the audio. Here's what loss prevention specialist said to us. Cody is somebody I have dealt with in the past and he is known to carry knives. That's why I mentioned knives. Okay, now the gentleman in the store was aggressive. He was threatening me the last time he was in the store, which is why I called the police to begin with. It's my understanding of Florida state statute as all of our deputies and detectives have told us, trespasses are for life until rescinded, it's misinformation. They expire, they do not. Damn it, here's the rule. You rescinded it when you transacted business with Mr. Tony Wynn, that's how it works. So you are technically correct that it does have to be rescinded by the entity, but all judicial rule, all case law supports that when business is transacted, you have effectively rescinded the trespass notice. There's more. According to Florida property attorney Hussein and Weber, trespasses can be invalidated. Here are the defenses to trespass. They posted these online. No actual communication to depart the premises once invited. Express invitation to enter or remain. Implied invitation to enter or remain. Withdrawal of request to leave the premises, lack of notice. Notice not properly posted, lack of communication to leave or not enter. Conflicting communications given to the accused. All of these are affirmative and allowable defenses. Toner disputes, he was aggressive to the guard. 
He's shopped at the store hundreds of times since 2013. And he uses a Walmart credit card that he obtained from that store. He shared his receipts with Indisputable. We were able to independently verify all of his documented background. Here's what Tony said, and I quote, I did not say anything to the guard that day. I didn't even see him that night. I walked in the store and I was in the store maybe five to 10 minutes before I got arrested. So let me pose this question to the loss prevention uh, prevention specialist. Are you saying that you just had a problem with two different Asian men at different times? Because the story about uh, Tony being aggressive against you does not match what you said to the 911 operator. You're changing the story post the narrative. That's what you're doing. All right, uh, he continued. If I were to freak out, I would have probably been killed that day over a misunderstanding. If I was dead on the news right now and all that was false information, this would have went stupid viral. His next court date is January 4th. We will continue to update you on this story. All right, dear brother, thoughts here. This seems to be like an absolutely egregious case in a lack of police work. And like it's, there's a lot to be said about the Walmart prevention specialist. I mean, these folks are like in the working class, like you're good at your job, you're bad at your job. Like sure, it seems like this doesn't seem to be like a good job that was done here. But you had a lot of descriptions. You have, you are cops, right? You can look at this guy's ID. You can pat him down. Does he have any knives? Does he have a Hummer? <laughs> like you, there's so many steps on this where information either wasn't communicated down or wasn't given properly that it seems like an absolute miscarriage of justice. Like it doesn't even seem that way. Like it, it is an absolute miscarriage of justice. And I'm glad that this story, like again, shows like this, we're giving it attention because this is definitely. Definitely not the first case where an Asian man has been mistaken for another one in justice, like in the case of justice, just because of some lazy police work. We see yeah. this happen in a lot of cases with a lot of people. So glad there will hopefully be some more justice and some more attention in this matter. Yeah, and listen, Walmart, they're not saying a damn thing from corporate. The employees are doubling down on this madness. That's what you call a public private partnership. All right, we got more on the other side, it's indisputable, stick and stay. All right, welcome back, we have a lot of show left. I'm pressed for time, but I'm going to read as many comments as I can, okay? And thank you all for always keeping it lively. Mickey C, the silver haired dragon says, how sad is it when Kanye West is a step up from a Trump? Yeah, yep, all right, uh, let's go to Pitchfork's Dragon. Tell me you need help paying your legal bills without saying you need help paying your legal bills. <laughs> yeah, uh, and Humanoid Dragon, welcome to Indisputable. Thank you for joining. Uh, anyone can join on the YouTube page, real simple. Just hit join, all right, we'd love to have you. Okay, got something for everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you Karen would. You want to call the police on them for having a barbecue on a and Sunday? You're I feel free. Back off. I'm going to tell them there's an African American man threatening my life. Look, 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 just let me out of your flat. I don't know what you're doing. This is absolutely ludicrous. Yes, it is. Look, I've just told you this radiator's not going to be working. I've got all of the other ones up. up oh, working. all of the other ones? In your flat, yeah. They all are working, are they not? Yeah, what about the other look, flats? Look, I do not want to be in your flat anymore. Please let me out. What are you doing? I am just trying just to Just move understand. out of my way. You're moving absolutely crazy. Just. Ugh. I am not crazy. You clearly are crazy because you're not letting me out of You that. mustn't speak to me like that. Just I'm out. sorry, would you apologize for me telling out. me I'm crazy and stand back. Stand back? Look, I'm in your flat. What are you doing? What's going on? Stop shouting at huh? me and bring him on the intercom right. and see what's going on, which is all I ask. What, what am I to do? You're upsetting me. You're really upset. I'm, I'm recording all of this, by the way, because this is absolutely crazy. I'm glad. <laughs> Let me out of your flat. When you've spoken on the Oh, my days. Please, look, I'm, I'm leaving. Look, look, what are you doing? Oh. Look. Oh. oh, you're pushing me around. 
Get your hands off me. What are you doing? Oh, oh, oh. What is... Oh, oh dear. You're pushing an elderly lady around. Yeah, I see what's going on here. Listen, Karen, I know you have OG status. All right, you've been doing this for a long time. But the man said he doesn't want to be in your flat. That means he doesn't want to be in anything else. There's more. How dare you, how dare you put your hands on me? Ask him on the intercom what is going on, which is what I asked him in the first place. I'm, I'm really confused what I need to do here because. Well, I'm confused, I'm very clear. Just find out if there's anybody else who is to. Right, where's, where's the intercom then? Let's go. Just go on. Turn right. Yeah. Oh, right. Come on, set it up for me. There it is. Set it up for me. I don't know how to I use that. Set it up. What do you mean? Set it up for me. No, I'm saying we're going to get out of the past, aren't you? You're moving nuts, bro. Oh, Crazy bitch, bro. I swear to God. Yeah, you heard me. I hope they heard you. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that was funny. Okay. What would you have done here? I mean, in my opinion, the guy handled it as best as he could have. All right. Uh, so this was about a repair. Um, obviously, he, based on his expertise, said, "Listen, this cannot happen right now, not in this moment." All right. Uh, OG Karen said, "No. Well, you're not going to leave my flat until this happens for me." There's one interesting dynamic about Karenicity that is global. They all believe in one thing in particular, that the world revolves around whatever the hell they desire. That's it, that's the premise of Karenicity. All right, Dan, thoughts here? No, I, I got chills when I saw her, this Karen. That I, we gotta have another name for a Karen who's like British, maybe a Susan, I don't know. But like, <laughs> we, we, we've got like, I've had chills because I had this literal experience happen to me, or a similar one. Not like I was doing a repair person or something, which clearly this repair person is doing their job. They're trying to document this as best as possible. But how quickly she shifts from I'm upset and I'm trying to control the situation to I'm crying to gain sympathy to okay, now you're going to do back what I say. Like, not even within the same minute, like 45 seconds, that all happens. So yeah. it's a manipulation tactic. This happened with me by I was just in a grocery store. And someone was trying to create a scene because they wanted to cut in line to get alcohol for me. And, I'm, and like, not for me, but like uh, in front of me. And by the way, this was 10 a.m. And so I was just like, listen, I, I'm not about it today. I, I'm gonna, not the kind of neighborhood where I would win, let's say. So let's just, let's just let this be and go ahead, cut the line, whatever. But this is such a Karen thing, a universal international Karen thing, uh, begging for sympathy and then turning around and just using that for a power dynamic. And so I'm glad this is recorded. And then the element uh, that is dangerous, obviously, when she started to act as if she was being attacked, right? That's yeah. the weaponization part. That part right there could get someone in a lot of trouble and also could get someone injured. And let's be, be very frank, somebody could die from an accusation like that. Um, so at least the police were not called and the accusation did not go beyond that moment. But the man recorded it so that he could protect himself. Good job. Okay, I've heard it all. A white male government employee is suing the city of Seattle because they had the audacity to make him go to training about how to not engage in institutional racism as a government worker. He found this to be quite offensive and discriminatory and made him feel guilty for being white. So he's fighting back. Let's put up his picture full mass here. An ex Seattle City worker is suing his former employer, alleging that he was discriminated against because of his white race. Joshua Dimert claims he was forced to work in a racially hostile environment. And working for the city was unbearable because he was forced to attend training sessions. 
about ending institutionalized racism and race based disparities in city government and made to feel guilty about being white. Upon reviewing the suit, it seems most of the allegations are related to a diversity training program. So let me get this right. He's complaining about going to a training program about eliminating racism in the workplace. He says that is racist against him, but he's not concerned about the fact that there's racism in the workplace experienced by black and brown people who work for the city and community members who live in the city have experienced adverse effect from racist employees or racism in the institution. He believes the remedy itself, which is simple, a training session was discriminatory, fascinating. All right, Joshua Dimer was a program intake representative at Seattle's Department of Human Services, working there from 2013 to 2021. He claimed in the suit that he was racially discriminated against by his colleagues. Okay, per the suit, in one instance, Dimert claimed a colleague told him it's impossible to be racist toward white people. In another, he claimed a colleague accosted him saying he was complicit in the sins of slavery. Overall, Dimert alleged his consistent reports of being discriminated against were blatantly ignored. Well, that'll do it. Ignoring a mediocre government white male employee will get action done every time. However, when the department introduced the race and social justice initiative, okay, that did it. Things escalated even further. For the suit, he believed all trainings. He was required to complete for work where were segregated by race and based on racial stereotypes. He was even cited trying to sign up for one reserved for people of color instead. You see what's happening here, right? Okay, there's more. Uh, Per the lawsuit, uh, the department requires that all employees participate in race and social justice initiative training that aggressively promotes the concept of white privilege. And the collective guilt that white employees like Mr. Dimert purportedly bear for societal inequality. The UIR workshop is rooted in critical race theory. There he goes. And the facilitators at the event stated that white people are like the devil. The racism in a white in white people's DNA. Racism is in white people's DNA and that white people are cannibals, according to him. Now, we don't have any independent evidence to validate any of this uh, coming from the training. When Mr. Dimert objected, the facilitators used their platform to belittle and attack Mr. Dimert, according to him. Other co workers that were present continued the mockery in the workplace and made Mr. Dimert the office a pariah. Mr. Dimert's co workers called him a white supremacist. In the suit, Mr. Dimert alleges an internal investigation was triggered by his claims of a hostile work environment. However, the lead investigator was part of a RSJI task force, Brandon Kendall. In the final report, no fault was found on the side of the department. Dimert claims his civil rights were violated under the Equal Protection Clause of the US Constitution, and he is requiring $300,000 in damages. Now, that's not even the saddest part. The saddest part is, depending on what judge gets this case, damn it, the man may get every penny he has proclaimed he's entitled to. So let's go ahead and highlight the irony of this whole thing. The man is literally using constitutional dynamics created because of white racist. He's using those constitutional protections in order to claim that he was discriminated against because a city decided 
to provide a remedy in the context of the same constitutional dynamic, which is fairness, equity in the workplace. Anti-discriminatory practices should be established. Because of culture, sometimes you have to be very intentional about making sure you get to the result you want. He finds the process to be, well, racist. All right, Dan, thoughts here. Yeah, I guess it's racist in the sense that, yeah, his civil rights have been offended as a white man in Seattle. Like, I'm, right. I'm trying to work with him very much. Like, what is it? Like, your culture here has been messed with. Okay, here's the thing, Mr. Dimert. I've got some respect for your culture here. I think the old saying is, uh, me think doth protest too much. <laughs> like, whoever is the one who is complaining, like, if you weren't racist or if you were an anti racist or like, you know, if you were just like, hey, listen, I have black friends. Like, I just, this does not bother me that much to spend some time presumably paid like by my workplace by taking some classes where I'm learning about some of these things, maybe getting a better perspective of not just anti black racism, but how this stuff has affected how Eastern Europeans at a certain point in American history, right? Like you might learn a thing or two. No, instead he decides to lawyer up, try to argue for getting $300,000 in damages. I love this whole idea of him arguing this legal case that someone accosted him by saying he was complicit in the sins of slavery. Like, I'm sorry your fragility is showing here like really, really badly and you spent a lot of money to show that fragility. But coming from the people who don't believe that speech equals violence and they constantly argue that all the time, it seems really, really rich. But ultimately this, he just seems like a clown to me. I would hope he didn't escalate to this level, but unfortunately in the judicial system, you get people who are like, all right, hey, let's take this up. Let's let this argue, let's see what happens. And so it hangs in the balance a little bit here, but I think we can all at least see in the public sort of view, this is very ridiculous. Yes, and hopefully the judge sees it the same way, we shall see. We have more on the other side, it's indisputable, stick and stay. All right, welcome back. We have a lot of show left. Let me read some of these comments. Um, C. Michael Henson, and thank you, C. Michael. Uh, do Karen's not understand how cell phone cameras work? How in the world can you lie on camera? <laughs> right. Uh, David Morris, he's worse at reading the room than Trump is, talking about the Seattle worker. Uh, and I thought this was a very good point. Velvet Goldmine. Says, but everyone had to attend that training, not just him. So how was he being discriminated against? That's actually mm -hmm. a very good point, a legal argument. As a matter of fact, there's one case we studied last semester in law school where an individual was able to successfully defend himself because evidence came out. Well, he was a jerk to everybody and that was okay. As long as he was a jerk to everybody, no one could claim that he was a jerk specifically to one person. Fascinating. All right, cop guilty of manslaughter. We covered this initially when it happened. Let me remind you of the video of what went down. That cop shot and killed a woman in her own home. He shot her through the window. Let's put up his picture and the picture of his victim. The former Texas officer responsible for the 2019 death 
of Atatiana Jefferson has now been found guilty of manslaughter. Aaron Dean is his name. The former Fort Worth, Texas officer was found guilty of manslaughter Thursday and the shooting death of 28 year old Jefferson in her home. Officer Dean who resigned days afterward and was arrested and charged in the killing now faces up to 20 years in prison for the conviction. Let me give you details about the verdict. He had pleaded not guilty to murder, a charge which carried a possible sentence of five to 99 years. Jurors were instructed Wednesday to also consider the lesser included offense of manslaughter. The sentencing phase begins today. The verdict was announced after jurors deliberated for more than 13 hours. The manslaughter conviction of a police officer who was on duty is the first in their county, according to the station, the local affiliate, WFAA. The verdict comes more than three years after the deadly encounter in which Dean and his partner responded to Jefferson's house around 2.25 AM, October 12, 2019. They arrived at her house after a neighbor called the non-emergency police line. Why? Because she wanted a welfare check. She saw a door opened. She did not call 911, she called the non-emergency line. The defense countered that Dean fired his weapon, all right? Um, That Dean fired his weapon in self-defense while fearing for his life. And what attorney said was a tragic accident, but not a criminal act. The prosecutors argued there was no evidence he saw a gun in the woman's hand before firing through a bedroom window. The prosecutor's first primary witness was this young man, Zion Carr, who was eight years old and in the bedroom with his aunt Tay when she was shot and killed in front of him. Now he's 11 and because this cop is a piece of you know what, it forced this young man to testify and to relive the most traumatic thing he will ever experience in his human existence. He testified that they had accidentally burned hamburgers earlier that night. So they opened the doors to air the smoke out. How many of us have done that? Probably every single one of us who are adults. He and his aunt were up late playing video games, right? Playing video games when Miss Jefferson heard a noise outside. And she then went to her purse to get her gun, he testified. He did not see her raise her firearm toward the window. Zion said he did not hear or see anything outside the window, but he saw his aunt fall to the ground and start crying. The other primary witness was Dean's own partner, Carol Darch, who testified she was with Dean when they investigated the home. Both officers believed the home was being burglarized because two doors were open, lights were on, cabinets wide open and things were thrown about. She had her back to the window when Dean began to yell out commands for Jefferson to put Her hands up, she testified. Dart said she started to turn around, heard a gunshot, then looked over Dean's shoulder and could see a face in the window with eyes as big as saucers. She did not see Jefferson holding a gun and did not recall Dean ever saying Jefferson had a gun. That is the reason I believe the cop should have been convicted of murder, not just manslaughter, but it is what it is. Um, Obviously, protocol was violated, policy was violated, never announced himself, never made sure his presence was known on the property. None of that happened. Anything to just suggest that you are the police would have saved her life. And it would have stopped this child from having such a traumatic experience. Even when there's justice, 
there's injustice. He gets convicted of manslaughter when anyone else would have been convicted of flat out murder. Dan, thoughts here. It's absolutely a tragedy. I mean, like it's heart wrenching to see this young kid testify, to see that her last, like his last memory of his aunt was they were playing video games together after you know one of the most you know average times where oh you have a meal, you're gonna have a good meal, you accidentally mess it up, you air out the house, it's fine. Even though it was a non-emergency line, these cops reacted with force, and when you see in that video there, it was like a one or two second response between. Where the cops hold your hands up and a gunshot firing off, it seems like she had no chance to even respond or show herself to respond, which is the pattern you see very often in these encounters. So yet another case for why we shouldn't always have armed officers who are ready to shoot before asking questions respond to these situations. That's right, well said. All right, we covered this when it first went down. We now have an update, five cops have now been charged for the fatal beating of Mr. Ronald Green. I'm going to take you back and remind you of the altercation, here it is. Let me see your hands, let me, let me see your hands, I got you. come here. I got, I got, I got, get out of the car now, get out of the car now. You see what happened, right? They killed him, 49 years of age, died. He died from that violent arrest. Green was brutalized by Louisiana State Police. With the cops involved, charges are as follows. Dakota DeMoss, one count of obstruction of justice. John Clary, one count of obstruction of justice, one count of malfeasance in office. Chris Harpin, three counts of malfeasance in office. Corey York, one count of negligent homicide, 10 counts of malfeasance in office. Commander John Peters, Commander John Peters. One count of obstruction of justice. These are the first criminal charges of any kind to emerge from Green's bloody death on roadside in rural Northeast Louisiana. A case that got little attention until an Associated Press investigation exposed a cover up and prompted scrutiny of top Louisiana State Police brass. A sweeping US Department, Justice Department review of the agency and a legislative inquiry looking at what? Governor John Bell Edwards knew and when he knew it. Let me give you background on the cover up. Green's May 10th, 2019 death was shrouded in secrecy from the beginning. When authorities told grieving relatives that the 49 year old died in a car crash at the end of a high speed chase near Monroe. An account questioned by both his family and even an emergency room doctor who noted Green's battered body. Still a coroner's report Listed Green's cause of death as a motor vehicle accident. That's called a good old boy system. A state police crash report omitted any mention of troopers using force. And 462 days would pass before state police.
began an internal probe. All the while, the body camera video remained so secret, it was withheld from Green's initial autopsy and officials from Edwards on down declined repeated request to release it, citing ongoing investigations. But then last year, the AP obtained and published the footage, which showed what really happened. Just a reminder, it's not the first time these cops have acted in unison to corrupt the process of our criminal justice system. Dan, thoughts here. So like in summation, they lied about his death saying that it was a crash, like a regular car yeah. crash. During the video, they tased him, kicked him, beat him, dragged him while he was crying for mercy in the video and admitted in the last moments of his life feeling scared. I mean, if you don't get chills from that, if you don't, don't have a memory of the George Floyd incident, yep. all that happened after that. Uh, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, I am absolutely angered by this, and there needs to be justice in this case. Not only justice, but like scorched earth, because for the people who still argue that there are good police out there, until there need to be like a massive reduction in these cases, because the good police stand up and go, don't tase him. That's not necessary. There's no need to drag him. There's no need to kick him. I'm going to stop you from killing this man. Then I have no reason to believe the good police are there because at bare minimum, the good police are standing idly by as bystanders and essentially, uh, as it looks appears to me, accessories to the actual incident at hand. So there That's needs right. to be justice here. That's right. All of these cops should be charged with murder. If they were another gang other than the police gang, let's say they were Pyru Blood or they were Crips. Everybody would have been charged with murder, but because they belong to a different kind of gang, they get a nuance that nobody else will be afforded. All right, Dan, always a pleasure, brother, having you on the program. Tell people how they can follow you, check out your great work. Always a pleasure to be with you as well. Um, at Twitter at Dan from the web until Elon Musk kicks me off, uh, but also YouTube, Dan from the internet, Twitch at Dan from the web. And uh, whenever I can be with the good doctor, uh, Rashad Rishi, good to be with you. And I'm very excited to see that interview with April Ryan. Uh, we've had agreements and disagreements in the past, yes. so I'm excited about that. Dear brother, always a pleasure. Thank you, my friend. Have a good one. All right, you too. We got more on the other side. It's indisputable, stick and stay. All right, welcome back. Let's get it. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. In the bullpen today, we have Miss April Ryan, White House correspondent, author, and DC Bureau Chief for the Grio. Now she has a new book. Her latest book is Black Women Will Save the World. An anthem. Well, I got to say this: a black woman saved mine for sure. All right, April, it's a pleasure. Thank you for being on the show. How are you, Dr. Richie? Thank you for having me. I'm excited about being here. Let's talk oh, about. <laughs> listen, absolutely. Let's talk about first your trajectory. You've been working in this position in a variable sense for about 25 years. You've had some really iconic moments where you were willing obviously to challenge power. And I always have significant respect for people who are willing to challenge power. How has that shaped not only your career in journalism, but where did it come from? Well, first of all, you have to remember as a member of the press, and if we look at the Constitution, if we look at what the founding fathers put in place, if we look at the amendments, particularly the First Amendment, freedom of the press is not second or third. Freedom of the press is very important. The independent press is there to ask questions of the president and his principles. And um, at issue is questions that um, range from water peace and everything in between. And I ask questions from water peace and everything in between. It's important that we ask, especially as life and death is written and spoken from that space. So my issue was, you know, I didn't do anything wrong. I asked questions because I was supposed to do it for my job. And after a while, you know, it, it, it in the last administration, um, it became a challenge and I had to really figure out, is this what I wanted to do? But I also looked at 
I took the emotion out of it and looked at it for what it was. I did nothing wrong. So, um, and if I walked away from it, um, <laughs> I would negate everything my late mother and father did for me. Mm. Out of a city called Baltimore, where failure is built into the very existence of the residents here. That's where it comes from. That's your catalyst, uh, your, your power. That- and an HBCU graduate and just being from real working class folks, understanding the stakes are high. I graduated from Clark Atlanta University HBCU here yes. in Atlanta. And so I understand the experience and it does fortify you because there's this cultural dynamic that says you simply have to fight on no matter yeah. what. No matter what, no matter yeah. what. We've been through too much and in and, and We've been through too much just by the sake of being HBCU graduates ourselves. Many of our institutions were born out of slavery. That's right. Slave masters feeling it was their Christian duty to help us learn to read the Bible at a time when we weren't supposed to read. So there's so much to this thing called life for black people. And when I asked questions, I understood that. And unfortunately, in some instances, it was met with. Fierce opposition, if you will. Yeah, I love the title. Um, Black Women Will Save the World, an anthem. Tell us about this book. An anthem means we're saying it over and over again. And black women, I mean, just look at what Trevor Noah just said. Yeah. Black women, when he finished his time on The Daily Show, he saluted black women. Not just because, but because they are undergirding him, undergirding this society, undergirding every community, every walk of life. And I mean, if you think about it, the face of the fight for voting rights, black women, they were the ones really going to jail at the very beginning of this last movement. Core Masters Barry, the head of the Congressional Black Caucus, Joyce Beatty, also Melanie Campbell from Atlanta, who is with the Black Women's Roundtable, Tamika Mallory, so many others. Then when you look at an organization called the Black Panther Party that was vilified back in the day and now celebrated. The visuals for many would think that it was men. And we saw a lot of men holding guns, but guess what? The Black Panther Party that promoted trying to find cures for sickle cell, um, that dealt with uh, free lunches uh, and well, free breakfast for our kids before they went to school in the morning, which the government is now funding. uh, And also health clinics, which the government is now funding, was 70% women. The Black Panther Party was undergirded by the power of women. Women who said, I'm doing this because I want to lift my community. I love my community. It was done out of love. And Dr. Richie, you know, um, in the book, I talked to Cornell Belcher, a dear friend who is a Democratic pollster for Brilliant Corners. And he said, you know, when women serve, particularly in politics, it's about uplifting and love for the community versus our male counterparts. Um, unfortunately, it's about power and ego. If, we, if you will, I mean, that's sometimes it's hard to say, but you know, it's- listen. Uh, you are 100% correct. Uh, and I think it's in the way we are positioned um, as uh, warriors or fighters or whatever it may be. Uh, we sometimes will affix ourselves to a frame that they created. Uh, but you're uh, spot on about the various movements have always had this um, strength uh, from black women. Now I want to go to a dynamic and pose it to you and and ask your feelings about it. We cover a lot of stories obviously on Indisputable about social dysfunction, um, racism, policy dynamics, uh, things that adversely impact society. Well, black women are the most underprotected demographic uh, in the United States, period, all right? So when you have an emphasis like this, what happens? People that feel as if uh, they uh, were entitled uh, to a special treatment or they should have had a book written about them, they will start to come out against you. Why was it important to write this kind of book now? You know, I haven't really had anyone come out against me because this mm. book is not about attacking. 
It's about my love letter to America about the strength of black women. I'm writing um, a book about what I see in the mirror. I'm showing up as a black woman and I'm writing about black women. And it's a love letter to America about our strength and how we stand and why we had to stand. We as a black community, particularly with with the population um, consisting of 52% of black women in the black community, we welcome everyone. We celebrate everyone, Dr. Ritchie. Yes. We bring everyone in, but when it's time for us to celebrate ourselves, we don't do it because we don't do it because we put ourselves last, because we bring everyone and we celebrate everyone. And now, in in the midst of this moment, as we see a rise, as we see Black women now convening the table, not just bringing a folding chair that's always perpetually on our back, but now convening the table and sitting people at that table. It is now time for us to celebrate the women in the schoolhouse, the women in our house, the women in the church house, the women in the Supreme Court, the black woman that's in the Supreme Court, okay? Yeah. Um, one of the nine. The black woman, the woman who identifies as a black woman in the White House as the Vice President of the United States, the black woman who is the mouthpiece for the President of the United States, Corrine Jean Pierre. We celebrate all black women because being black, and being a woman in America, like Shirley Chisholm said, is a double whammy. Mm. But in this moment, we still celebrate. And then as we pause to celebrate, we're gonna celebrate other people too, but it's time to celebrate. But in this moment, if we don't celebrate, we lose the momentum. So well said, my daughter is a big fan of yours. Oh. And oh goodness. And you have been able to do something quite unique and I think um, trailblazing. You are able, without effort, I believe, I think it's natural for you. You are able to be authentically everything you are. You are authentically a black woman. Oh, you yeah. are authentically a journalist. You are authentically not afraid. You are all of this in one package. And I think we do ourselves a disservice when we start to negate the reality of our experiences, exposures, and environments. Okay. When we try to dismiss them in order to become something or someone else in another context. Right. You have not done that. Tell me uh, how that has made a unique pathway for you. Um, I can't show up in any other way. Mm. Uh, I come from a large family of agrarians, working class. And I'm telling you, my parents have gone on to glory. But I tell you, they would come out of glory and their rest if I showed up any different. <laughs> if I right. And my parents always told me to be humble and service is everything. I come from that kind of family. But one thing for sure, I show up the way I do because I want black women and black people to be seen. And this book makes black women seen. And I love it. The community as well. I love it. Black women will save the world and anthem. Make sure you get it. I'm getting my copy today. My dear sister, it's a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you, Dr. Richie. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Remember, take care of yourself, take care of each other, take care of the planet. Remember, the truth is always indisputable. Welcome to Indisputable. I'm your host, Dr. Rashad Richard. We got a lot happening today. But what do we do on this show? We tell the truth. You know why we tell the truth? Because the truth is simply indisputable. Rashad, great to be here. Congratulations on the new show. And I gotta let everybody know that Rashad and I go way back. Here's the pattern that we see in all of these Karen stories. They think they own stuff they do not own. Now, where does that come from? I don't know, maybe slavery. Maybe they think they should still own black people. This is what happens when Karens weaponize the police. When you're used to privilege, equality seems like oppression. It hits you in a certain way when someone is holding you against your will, treating you like you're a criminal and you're an innocent person. This is something that black people face no matter where they are. A stronger black economy lends itself to a stronger, greater economy. Don't think it's exclusive of you, it's inclusive of you. What should be with critical race theory? It adds more fuel to the fire of the racist tendencies that we already have. We have a generation of problem solvers that can remedy the problem if they are properly taught what the problem is. You know who created redlining in this country? Mm -hmm. The white liberal. 
I, I, don't, I don't give a damn who created it. If it's a racist policy, racist policy. Shelly, That's here's what I don't know. I don't know. See, there you go filibustering, brother. You're scared of this truth, but you're gonna get it though.